Okay, that was a lot. A little too much. I, I ain't all that. Um, but I am grateful to be here with you guys. Y'all are awesome, man. That worship. Can we give it up? Like, what? What? Metro. You know what I mean? <laughs> that if you know. Yeah, oh, is that, is that how it goes? Metro, let's go? Is that what it is? It worked, though. I like that. It worked. You know what I mean? We, we doing something. We doing something. How y'all doing? It is so good to see y'all. So one thing you'll learn about me, I like uh, engagement. So I, I hope y'all are well and equipped to be active participants in this thing that we call the sermon part of the sermon, right? First off, let me just correct something with the Carrillos. Like, me and my wife have been blessed. You know, we were leading in the Bronx. We've been in the Bronx, New York for about 12 years serving in that ministry and working with Sam and Cynthia Powell, Will and Rose Ashley. You know, it's just some great disciples. I know you guys have known of some of these guys. And, and um, when we decided to go to be a part of this church planting in Princeton, uh, you know, the Mercer area, it was awesome because uh, the group there was about 23 disciples there. And those 23 disciples have been faithful, long-time uh, disciples and strong. And they're like, we just want to build something to God's glory. And God blessed it, man. The Princeton Campus University we saw go up to about 14 disciples at Princeton alone. We had our ministry grow from 23 disciples to now over 100 disciples there. But here's the thing that was so unique. Now, Robert says he, doesn't, he ain't never seen us, right, and didn't know who he was, but he knew people who knew us, right? But here's the blessing that we had. That foundation that we came to, those disciples, see, Robert, the Carrillos, they led the Central Jersey Church. That was their foundation. And when you build with costly, precious stones, anything is possible. And I want to thank you guys for the foundation you laid there. Because if you didn't lay that foundation the way y'all did, I mean, the disciples that we have, they speak highly of the Carrillos. And, and even just coming here and seeing how they've been doing a work here, it's just, I see the love that they give and the attention they give to a proper foundation. A proper foundation that could be built on and could stand the test of time. And so thank you guys so much for, for all that work. We wouldn't be able to experience any of that if it wasn't for you guys. So thank you. All right, let's get into this. I ain't got a long time. So, um, all right, we all went through this pandemic. I want to hear from you. Give me one word you feel God taught you coming out of that pandemic. Okay, gratefulness. What'd you say? Hmm? Humble out. Amen. That's two words, but amen. <laughs> Go ahead. Huh? Endurance? Oh, yeah, endurance, definitely. Perseverance, okay. Connection, all right, way in the back, I got you. Courage, amen. Ooh, what, say it again? Desperation. Ooh, I want you to expand, but I can say one word, so you can't. Go ahead. Surrender, amen. Fearlessness, okay. Contentment. Patience. Oh, he took it from you, it's all right, you know what I mean? Go ahead. Hmm? Zoom. <laughs> That's real. I never heard of Zoom until the pandemic. I was like, what is Zoom? I thought Skype was going to take off. That's what I was under there. I'm like, well, Skype, Microsoft about to make some money. And then Zoom came out of nowhere, right? It was crazy. Go ahead. It's unstoppable. Ooh, yeah. Perseverance. Didn't we already say that, though? But you want to say it again. I understand, brother. I got you. <laughs> Family. Amen. Amen. Anyone? Go ahead. Perspective. Perspective. That's good. Yeah. Self-control. Yeah. Unpredictable. Let's pause with that one. Unpredictable. Who expected it? Who, even though we went through it, could look back and be like, we went through that. Like, it's still kind of hard to believe that, like, that happened, right? Like, it was real. You know, I have this definition I shared with my ministry. I was like, my summary of 2020 is this. It's a pandemic combined with an economic shutdown that left us teetering on an economic meltdown 
while navigating social unrest during an election year. That's some wild stuff. We did that. We went through that. Who are you now? Who are you now? How is your faith today? Your faith in 2019 versus your faith in 2024, what's the difference? Do you see a difference? Are you stronger? Are you weaker? You know, the world changed drastically. And I want to be clear, it ain't all bad. It's not all bad. But the world changed drastically. But my question to you is, have your convictions changed? So I got this clicker. This looks like a bomb detonator. Like, that's just, I just want you all to know it's a clicker, okay? For the PowerPoint. That's scared me when I got it. I was like, what do y'all want me to do with this? Like, jeez. All right, back to the sermon. So have your convictions become more grounded or have they filtered off? Have you found yourself in a position where you're like, okay, I need to recalibrate all my convictions? I'm sure that happened. I ain't going to lie. I was one of them. I was like, I need to recalibrate some stuff. I need to re, 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 re-examine some things. You know, my convictions on purity, righteousness, godliness, fellowship, on character. I mean, we had conversations with people on dating. Like, what is, da- what is dating, right? You know what I mean? What does that look like? And all this stuff was on display. Here's one thing I really want us to, to imagine. We talked about this concept. You know, Jesus shared the parable about building your house on what? You're going to build on a rock, not on the sand. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> on the rock. Build the house on the rock, right? And that difference. And how do you know you're building on the rock versus you're building on the sand? And I always say, when your fear corrects your faith, you know you're building on sand. You know, our faith could say go, but our fears say, you better stop. (laughs) Our faith could say give, but our fear could say, nah, you hold on to that. You know, our faith could say trust, but our fear says again. Really? Are you serious? We're going to act like we didn't see what we just saw? We're going to act like we didn't go through what we just went through? You know, we have to ask, is our fear correcting our faith or is our faith correcting our fear? And this ain't an easy question, but if you claim to be a disciple of Jesus, you got to ask this question. You know, our fear is based on the unknown and painful past experiences. But our faith is based on the unknown and an optimistic future. This is big. And I just want y'all to know, I'm not talking as someone who hasn't done my research on the history here. Y'all been through it. Can I be honest with that? I just, I just, y'all been through it. This, this is tough. And for every brother and sister that's here right now, praise God. That has inspired me and my wife's heart. Just during our time here with you guys. So I want to put a pause on that stuff, and I want to come back to this, my topic that I want to really hone in on, but we'll revisit it towards the end. And I want to talk about our foundation and our identity. Our foundation and our identity. You know, what we build on is a product of who we believe we are. What we build on is a product of who we believe we are and what we believe we are called to be. That's what our foundation is. And Jesus said, you are meant to be, you are the, there you go, salt of the earth. You are the, this is what he called us. And all that sounds great on a (laughs) t-shirt. Right? Uh, You can look, you put that on there, it sounds great on a t-shirt. But what does that look like in real life? What does it look like to be the salt of the earth? In the light of the world, especially in a world like this. 
You know, when we talk about the salt, we tend to talk about salt the way we use salt, right? This is like historic. I've seen this all the time, you know. And typically when we talk about you are the salt of the earth, what are we saying? You are, what are you, what are you called to do? You're called to add a little flavor, right? A little sazon, you know what I mean? Some adobo, right? That's what, that's what we say, all right? That's what we look at it as, right? Or we say it's to what? Someone said it over here. Preserve, right? We're called to be the museums of Christianity, right? For all those who want to come and examine what Christianity was meant to be, come and look at us into our museum because we are upholding the standard. But what did Jesus say about this? It's really important for us to go back because he didn't really call us to, he didn't say like a little sprinkling of Christianity makes the world taste better. That wasn't the intention. That wasn't the mindset, or, or Christians are called to preserve the moral standard and compass of society. But when we look at Christianity and we hear it being described, it's typically described in these fashions. Right? But I'll tell you this, that definition does not make any kingdom impact in this world, nor does it unleash the power of the Holy Spirit in our communities. And I think we need to go back to what Jesus specifically said and how he defined this. You know, in Luke, uh, Jesus defines what this means in Luke 14, verse 34. Do I press the green button to go to the next slide? All right, I just want to check. That's the red one. That's good. Oh, that's exploding. Hey! I'm from New York. Don't be putting them bomb things. That's still triggering for me. All right. <laughs> Look. Luke 14, verse 34, it says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is neither fit, it is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile, and it is thrown out. This is interesting. This is one, this scripture always puzzled me. It sounds very basic, but it's actually a bit confusing if you don't understand the times that he was talking, right? Right? When he says it's neither fit for the soil nor the manure pile, he's telling us what salt was used for in the ancient world. He's literally saying salt was used for soil or the manure pile. That's what he's saying. You know, and when we talk about this, you know, Jesus is talking from the perspective of he comes from, you know, an area where there's a Dead Sea, right? Right? The Dead Sea, anyone know about the Dead Sea? Anyone been, visited the Dead Sea? Y'all, some of y'all floated in it? It's kind of just chilling out, you know what I mean? What's some characteristics that make the Dead Sea unique? Okay, a lot of salt, ah, good. What else, anyone else, any characteristics? Buoyancy, Buoyancy. meaning you cannot go down. You, can, you, can't, you, can't, you can't drown in it. Many have tried. All right, it just came out salty, and <laughs> that was that wasn't an intended joke, but it was funny. You know what else? Go ahead. Ooh, yeah, purifies the body, right? It's good. So those who went in it, your skin's good, right, Robert? That's why his skin's so nice. You know what I mean? It was good. Go ahead. Yeah, they soak it to heal. It has healing properties, right? Another unique thing about it is that nothing could live in it, right? There's no life in there. No fish, right? And so in their time, they would sweep up the salt from the Dead Sea, right? It was a big thing. And they would use this salt to make potash. Any planters in the house? All right. Oh, not many of y'all. Look, I'm a plant dad. I am a proud plant dad, all right? I'm all about that. Now, I done killed many of them. I've been a plant murderer. I should be locked up. I should be, you know, but praise God for the grace of Jesus that we don't persecute people for that. So, but in that process, I've learned a lot on how to grow plants, right? And if you go into my place, it's like a little garden in there because I just love growing plants. I think it teaches me a lot about life in a lot of ways. But potash, for those who are plant lovers, what is that used for? Soil. You never bought it? Girl, you need to buy it. You need to get that. Then you're just going to transform your plants, all right? This isn't a commercial for plants, all right? But I'm just letting you know. Look, 
the thing is, potash is very interesting because it's 28% salt solution, right? And it's different mixtures of salt. And the main salt in the Dead Sea was what they call potassium chloride, right? And with that, it helps really bring life and oxygen to the soil that helps produce fruit with plants. They call this plant uh, potash, right? And so they would scoop this up from the Dead Sea and it was used as fertilizer, it was used as fertilizer because it had potash in it. So Jesus wasn't talking about table salt when he said, you are the salt of the earth. He was talking about fertilizer. Now, what does that do? Woo. Grows. Brings life. Right? Nutrients. That's a little different than table salt. Brings diabetes. <laughs> Part of that. Hypertension. Doc, Doug, tell him, tell him, Doug, tell him. <laughs> Luke 14, verse 35, it says, It is neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. The word soil that Luke uses is the same word Matthew uses for that, and it's translated as earth. It's earth. The fertilizer you put on the soil makes good things grow. So now, that's one definition we have of salt. It makes good things grow. Then he says, this manure pile, right? What's this manure pile? Now, when you think of the manure pile, typically we think of what? Yes, yes it's definitely doo-doo, okay? Someone really wanted to say that. <laughs> definitely, you got it, right? Definitely, dude, what else? Cow manure, right? But now, here's the funny thing. They're not talking about animal poop. I'm talking about human. See, in the ancient time, in Jesus' time, they had this area, it was little outhouses where you would use the bathroom, right? You dump it in a bucket, and then you take the bucket and you throw it in a pile, and that's a pile of human poop and feces, right? But no. <laughs> But with that, with that pile, there's a box right next to the pile. And guess what was in that box? Salt. And what did they do with that salt? There, yeah, they sprinkled a little salt on the manure. There, yeah, there you go, salt bay. You know what I mean? A little salt bay on the manure pile, all right? They put it on the manure pile. Why did they do this? Kill the germs. The salt was used to stop the growth of bad things. Y'all starting to get where I'm going with this? When Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, he's saying, you are called to promote the growth of good things and to stop the growth of bad things. How do I click? Where's my clicker? There you go. This, and the thing is, this wasn't up for our interpretation. He literally said it. Right? Like he literally said it. But this is how we do things with the Bible, right? We always want to add our spin on it. This is why our convictions get twisted. Because rather than going back to the word and allowing the word to refine our convictions, what do we do? We let our society, our culture, our experiences to define our convictions. Y'all catching this? This is tough. But it's real. Jesus called you to promote the growth of good things and to stop the growth of bad things. So now that we have this negative, positive perspective of salt, we got to ask ourselves, what are we doing in our communities as disciples? You know, salt doesn't work in a box. Salt has to have direct contact, right? 
Direct contact with the poop. Direct contact with the earth in order to do what it was called to do. Right? You know, I, I, we talk about, you know, most Christians, most disciples, they want to get out of environments where they're the only disciple or the only Christian there. They're like, I just want to be around Christians. And, and I'm like, why? What are you talking about? They're like, oh, I need to be around other, you know, I'm like, no, what do you mean? You, you're the salt. You're the salt. You're there to promote the growth of good things. You're there to detour the growth of bad things. Who told you that this was about you? You know, God called you there because he wanted some salt there. And I think we all need to pray that God brings more salt in the areas that we find ourselves. Salt can only work with direct contact with the dirt. But then he says this. Next thing, he talks about the light. Right? You are the light of the world. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? This is interesting. Anyone ever understood this part? This was like a puzzle for me. Right? How can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on underfoot. So I have a question. How does salt lose its flavor? Woo, 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 woo. There you go. There you go. Diluted. See, I had to ask myself this. I'm like, God, I don't understand. Like, salt can't lose its saltiness. That means it just ain't salt. But I had to kind of dig, okay, well, if he's saying this, it must be true. What does he mean by this? It's about it being diluted. It's actually impossible for salt to lose its saltiness, right? But it can be contaminated or adulterated by other substances. This is real with salt. This is big. The only way salt can lose its saltiness is by being mixed with other stuff, and it loses its quality. You know, back in ancient times, what typically would happen is merchants would go through and they would shift and they would get the salt. But, you know, sneaky, bad merchants, what they would do is instead of shifting it through and getting all the sand out, they would just bag it all up and sell it at the marketplace. And so people would go and they'd buy it thinking I'm getting some salt to put on my manure pile or to put in my plants to help it grow, and then when they dump it out, they notice that their salt is mixed with sand. And then they're like, oh, I got the wrong thing. They throw it out, and it gets trampled underfoot. You know, this contamination is real. Have you been contaminated? Have you been contaminated? What's in our bag? Are we pure salt? Or do we got some other stuff in it? We got some other stuff in it. You know, this is big for us to ask ourselves. Are we pure salt or are we half salt, half sand? Pure salt prevents things from rotting. And this is a big point. Christians will only influence the world if they're different from it. You got to be different. We got to be different from it. You know, the church, not just Christians, but the church has to be salty. And we can't be contaminated. You know, our desire to be accepted, our fear of being hurt, these things cause us to worry. It causes great worry. And I think worry is the number one thing that stops disciples from being what God called them to be. Matter of fact, this is why Jesus preached so extreme against worry. Matter of fact, Jesus said on the Sermon of the Mount very clearly that he forbid disciples to worry. And that's why we don't worry, right, in this church. 
nobody, no one worries, right? We all follow that command, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. That was the weakest amen I think I've ever heard in my life. (laughs) I've heard louder amens at Princeton, and they don't even, you know, that's a whole world. (laughs) But I get it. I get it. I struggle with it. It's real. It's real. And this is what's interesting. Worry is dangerous for Christians because it says something to the world about our God. This is why worry is so dangerous. It says something to the world about our God. Our God. Remember, Matthew 5, verse 6, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is interesting, this component of light. A lot of times when we talk about light, we think it's for us. Light my way so that I don't stumble and I don't fall. That's not what this scripture said. This scripture said the light is not for you. The light is for others. For others to find their way. For others to find our God. We could be so self-consumed. And we forget that God called us to have kingdom impact in this world. The way you conduct your life will signal to the world something powerful about your faith. So when you worry, what you're saying to God and what you're saying to the world is that God cares more about the animals and the pets in this world and in his garden than he cares about his own children. That's what we say to this world. We say the birds, the lilies, they all good. They ain't got nothing to worry about. But me? His child? Oh, I got to be terrified of this world. Why did Jesus spend so much time on this topic? The Sermon of the Mount, I call that the Constitution for Christians. I've spent years preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Like, poor Mercer, they had to deal with that one. I was like, we're we going to learn this Sermon of the Mount because this is everything. It's everything. He spent so much time on this because he knows how natural it is for us to worry. It's supernatural to not worry. To not worry is a supernatural gift. That means you got to depend on the Holy Spirit. It is an, it is a, it is an enormous amount of trust and dependency on the Holy Spirit because everybody worries. Everybody worries. Only a supernatural person could stand strong in the storm. How powerful would it look like if the news was talking about all this crazy stuff happening in the world, but man, the Christians, they are just not phased. The, The world is going crazy, terrified of all this stuff, but Christians, they're faithful. They're like, no matter what happens, we're okay. No matter what, no matter who's elected, we're good. No matter how the economy gets, we're going to be all right. What if Christians walked like that? What would that say to this world? We are missing out on the power that God called us to have. The Holy Spirit is real. The Holy Spirit works in us. But when you cave in to the worries of this world, you signal to this world that God ain't real. And if he is, he ain't that powerful. That would be a real testimony if we could say, if the world could say that about the churches, about Christians, that you, as things get crazy, As things get insane, you got peace. You're not anxious for nothing. 
That church is a light. That's a light. Oh, they're going to look at you. They're going to see you. You're going to stand out. They might mock you, though. They might call you names. You don't get it. You don't understand. You're disillusioned. You're going to stand out. You ready for that? Are you really ready for that? I know we say that real loud right now, but when you walk out of here, are you ready for that? Say yeah when you walk out these doors. You know, I got to wrap up here, but to know and be confident in this truth that God will not see that I get everything I want, but I'll get everything I need. To be confident and assured of that. I have been inspired by the testimony of faith and perseverance within this congregation. And I am inspired to see what God's going to do in the future. But we need to make sure we understand who we are and whose we are. You are the light of this world. You are the salt of the earth called to promote the growth of good and detour the growth of bad things. Therefore, God has called you to be active in this world, not a consumer and not passive, but to be an agent of grace and love in this world. Let's make sure we go out and we're a light to this world. Amen.